Well, just like the world says, so people are they're part of the world. Counselors, even so-called Christian counselors, and other people who advise other people who are wealthy or wise or rulers, worldly wise, they say Christians are accused, they're accusing Christians of presenting their views too harshly and too negatively. Not only too arrogantly, most comments against Christian witness revolve around accusing the believer of not presenting God's word in a way which would not make others angry. They say that they probably use the word Bible or leave the, any kind of scripture out of it. Nevertheless, the message is the same. But unbelievers and carnal Christians who resist truths from God's word are hostile to hearing truths from scripture, no matter how well presented. Their reaction will often be one of emotional defensiveness and personal attack on the faithful believer, sometimes physical. Romans 8, 7, 8, the sinful mind could be unbeliever or carnal Christian is hostile to God. Believers who knuckle under this demand to adjust their delivery are successful in not making many angry because they no longer present the truth of God's word, but in fact present human viewpoint on truth with a view out of context incorrectly used scriptures, with a few out of context incorrectly used references from scripture, Paul called this another gospel. How about trying to make some kind of human doing part of it? Galatians 1, 6 to 9, like keeping the law. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. In verse 7, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. How often does that happen to you or me? People have their own point of view. And he said, could you give me chapter and verse? That's what made my therapist really ra angry. Chapter and verse. I don't give chapter and verse. Well, you pretend to say what the Bible says. And then when I ask you where he got it, you get angry and condemn me. <clears throat> Galatians 2, 15 to 16. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law. There you go. But by faith in Jesus Christ. So we, too, have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. So Paul is saying it is faith alone, in Christ alone, which justifies God in providing an individual with eternal life with him in heaven. And so God is justified in giving you justification by declaring your righteousness you have the righteousness possessing in you, possessed in you, or declared in you, of Christ. And you don't have to rely on your own righteousness. So it's not by the keeping of any set of moral rules, such as the Mosaic Law. You want to keep a set of rules, keep the Mosaic Law, but you'll readily, quickly realize that you'll fall short immediately. <clears throat> Galatians 1, 6 to 9 continued, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of God and and turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you all into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. So what many popular preachers are doing even today is what the Apostle Paul soundly rebukes as a false gospel. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, and so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let it be eternally condemned. <clears throat> the question remains, why would you present something different than what you uh, received and believed in when you originally saved? Most people just don't have an answer to that. They just move on to something additional. For example, most people are incest at the idea that once having trusted in Christ as Savior, how they behave after their conversion does not affect their eternal destiny in heaven. Why would you be incensed at that? You get a free grace gift. Well, I know it's not a good idea to behave proper, improperly, because it sometimes is an arrogant thing. You think you're behaving better than your next door neighbor, and you don't like the way your next door neighbor behaves, so you condemn his actions, and you tell the next door neighbor, you got to behave right. Look at me. <clears throat> so just for being better than the next guy, 
to set up, you have to be as good as Jesus Christ. Don't worry about your neighbor next door. For example, most people are incensed at the idea that once having trusted in Christ as Savior, how they behave after their conversion does not affect their eternal destiny to heaven. Many discussions about our Lord start out calmly until the subject of eternal security comes up. And then, calm reason through the scriptures is replaced by an angry, personal attack on the believer who explains the sealing ministry of God the Holy Spirit until the day of his redemption. I've had people come after me like this. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed. That's it. You were marked in him with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. See that word guaranteeing? What does it mean? Eternal security. Guaranteeing our eternal inheritance until the redemption, our eternal redemption of those who are God's possession. And that's you and me. We're placed in Christ. We're now God's possession. We're Christ's possession at the moment that you believed. Having believed, it says, right? To the praise of his glory. There's no way to explain this and try to insert something that you have to do to verify it or seal it. The Holy Spirit's done this seal. You're not any bigger than the, and God is. This passage says that the moment of simple trust, that's all believing is, as a child simply puts his trust, at the moment of simple trust alone in Christ alone, then one is saved and sealed by God, the Holy Spirit, until the day of his redemption. His sealing is receiving his eternal glory and eternal body. No matter what. Well-meaning, but misguided Christians will often advise the faithful believer that he must earn the right to be heard. <clears throat> in order to do this, he must first listen to all of what the unbeliever has to say. I'm not listening to that. A discussion usually has one short point at a time. You want to me to submit to a lecture from somebody who doesn't know what he's talking about? You're kidding me, right? In rebuttal to this, one might ask, where in the Bible does it say to do this? To listen to human viewpoint and false doctrine at length. An experienced Christian needs only to hear a few phrases to know immediately where the unbeliever or carnal Christian is coming from. Just do your homework and you, you know this. Then it becomes his responsibility to gracefully jump in and provide the truth at the point where the other person diverted into error. Further listening to error only contaminates the minds of everyone with a near shot. Protect yourself. Protect your own ears. Those who are so sensitive as to be offended by an interruption are inevitably those who could keep would keep right on talking, dominating the conversation, and never permitting a word, uh, permitting a word to, to be an edgewise that I can respond to. This kind of individual makes his point by disallowing any other viewpoint. That's the way you'll win. Yeah, I win, I win the race. No, nobody else is allowed to compete. With him, especially, is interrupted. his interruption vital. As the supreme example, our Lord did not listen at length to the erroneous opinions of others. He did most of the talking. <clears throat> you want to make a point? You have a right to make a point. You want to make it a fair discussion, one point at a time, and then let the other person rebut. It never goes on that way. You start doing it, and they interrupt and dominate. Wait a minute, I'm not finished. I'm not. Yes, you are. You made one point. Can I answer it? Then they go, three more points. Can I answer one of those four points? No. Can I answer one of the 16? It goes 16, 20, 100. And then all of a sudden, can I speak? No. Isn't that interesting how they say you're not allowed to speak? And then when the conversation started out with, we're having a discussion, right? Back and forth, back and forth. When we differ, let's try to work it out. Oh, yeah. And all of a sudden, I'm not letting you talk. Wow. Nasty pills. You take nasty pills. Too many pastors faced with opposition have followed the route of preaching another gospel. Many individuals find it more palatable accepting what many preachers call the gospel presented as follows. Let Jesus into your heart or into your life. Give him your problems. Let him be the Lord of your life. Then your life will change. Old habits will go away. Success will come. Relationships will be reestablished and renewed. Where's the eternal life in that? But this is not the gospel of salvation at all. God's word clearly states what the gospel of salvation is and what it is not. Where would you go? I'd go to John 3, 16 and 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Done. Now let's say at 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned. There you go. Anything else? Repent? No. Turn over a new leaf? No. Make Jesus the Lord of your life? No. Where is it? No. It just says believe. Believe in what, by the way? 
Believe what's just said. God gave his one only son. For what? For your sins. That's implied. And that's it? Yes. So whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe. Now we say whoever does not believe. Does anybody before doesn't believe? Now you have to exclude those infants and those not born yet. Right? They don't have the capacity or the wherewithal, the opportunity to believe. But whoever does not believe that's accountable and alive stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one only Son. Don't believe, remain condemned. Do believe, no longer under condemnation. Simple as that. Excluding not born yet babies, not born people, and infants or children that are not of accountable understanding or age. It is therefore a matter of faith alone, faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ and him alone, plus nothing else. Sounds like redundant. I have to make it redundant because people just don't get it. Well, what about what my grandmother said? 1 John 5, 9 through 13, we accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his son. I just finished 1 Corinthians chapter 1. At the very end, it talks about the gospel is foolishness. That's man's testimony without God's understanding built into your mindset. But God's testimony is obviously greater. He's creator. Let him have his say and adopt his saying because it's wise and true. <clears throat> and this is, goes on to verse 10. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart, in his understanding, in his mind. Heart, mind. They're synonymous in this context. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony of God is given about his son. And this is it. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. Given means gift, free, no obligation, before, during, or after. And this life is in his son. So it's all about his son, Jesus Christ. He who has the son has life. Well, life is in the son because what did the son of God do? Died for your sins. That's the implication throughout First John book. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the, the propitiation for your sins. 1 John 2, 2. For he is the propitiation Christ for our sins and not for our sins only, but the sins of the whole world. There's the gospel. When you get to 1 John 5, 9 through 13, you get repetition, reaffirmation, corroboration. And this is the testimony God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son, in his son's propitiation for your sins. 1 John 2, 2. It's established that already, because that's in chapter 2. This is chapter 5. And verse 12, 1 John 5, 12. He who has the son has life. Did you believe? You have the life. He who does not have the son of God, who does not have the son of God, does not have life. Again, you believe, you have it, and you have it forever because it's eternal. You don't believe, you don't have it yet. Against, again, it is faith alone in Christ alone which brings the gift of eternal life Ephesians 2 8 9 for by grace you have been saved through faith that not of yourselves gift of God there's the given gift of God not by works not of yourselves gift of God not by works so that no one may boast and upon believing one believing one can then be assured that one has eternal life no matter what and the final capstone on this phrase this great passage I write these things. John writes these things to you and me who believe in the name of the Son of God. Do you believe? Yes. So that you may know now. Remember when you believed. You know now because you remember that you believe that you have eternal life. Note that nothing is mentioned in this passage about making Jesus the Lord of your life, which is an act of work prohibited in salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Nor is anything mentioned about letting Jesus into your heart. Acting in obedience to Christ and his word is a choice that individuals, once they become believers, are commanded and exhorted to make, but not for salvation. You've already got that. And you can't make a, a, a good direction toward being faithful and obedient until you do become a believer because you need the Holy Spirit's guidance and impetus and circumstances provided for your faithfulness. All of the scripture passages which exhorts the believer not to act like the world, but to act righteously are proof of the fact that believers can remain saved and choose to act like the world. Otherwise, why call them believers?
So no passage in the Bible states that an individual loses eternal destiny in heaven from misbehaving. Some